courtesy of your hosts, Derek G and AJ. So leave it to the UFC, AJ, to end the calendar year with a split decision and another controversial decision to some, right? Now, at the end of the day, I do believe that the correct man got their hand raised in victory. However, the question was, if you look at the scorecards, none of the judges really came to a consensus. He had 49-46s both ways. The same rounds weren't necessarily being scored, but I think it's safe to say Sean Strickland probably won the first opening two rounds, and Cannoneer took off with the last remaining three. Now, the thing that I want to talk to you about here, though, AJ, isn't even a matter of scoring, but it's a matter of style. And this is why I felt Jared Cannoneer could win this fight. Sean Strickland, did I think he was going to go straight Pereira style again walk right in front of cannoneer and let his head get knocked off like no but the jab and run style though i'm a very big fan of it shout out floyd mayweather and all that is not as conducive in the eyes of the judges when you have a man walking you down throwing big shots at you beating up your legs just kind of cutting you off across the cage in the eyes of the judges i think that they don't favor that jab and run style as much as as much as like it is effective, I guess I should say. So give me your thoughts on that, man. Do you think it's simply the aesthetic of the performance of Sean Strickland that lost him the fight, or did he actually need to do a little bit more? No, I think it was aesthetics, man. And to, and to the credit of Jared Cannonier, he did come on in the end and really put, you know, start ble uh, blooding up Sean Strickland. But um, I do think it had to have been a little bit more of that aggression style that it, it, it you just look like you're doing more even in the cage. Because like you said, Derek, that jab and run is a lot more effective. And there's one very frustrating thing about fighting somebody that just keeps sticking their jab in your face and then they're out and they can't, you can't, you can't hit them back. They're just eluding you. It's very frustrating. A lot of damage gets done. But it's not the damage in the fact of like big shots, you know what I'm saying? So I think the judges were counting more for that. And because the damage is a big scoring factor, it is the first scoring factor for the judges. But which one does, which one counts more, man? Me personally, I'd rather have somebody not jabbing me in the face all day and have it kind of that tactical fight where we can both have that same kind of style of Jared Cannonier. Because that jab in the face is, is, is annoying, man. So I can see where the Sean Strickland fans say he did enough, say he had enough output. He was controlling a lot of the fight. But I agree with you, Derek. I think the right man won the fight on this one. I think the, the problem was um, the lack of mixing it up target-wise for Sean Strickland, right? Jared Cannonier is beating up the leg. As you could see the visible damage on Strickland's leg. Um, he was throwing those big combinations, that big right cross, left hook combination. And he was literally popping Strickland's head back, you know, kind of a lot like that. Strickland, though, he, I mean, he took it like a champ, bro. Fantastic chin. You could tell that Pereira literally just hits like a fucking monster because Cannonier was cracking Strickland. But he also does a very good job of just kind of moving out of the way of these little shots, rolling with the punches. You could tell, very mm -hmm. experienced in sparring, right? So uh, I just think if Sean Strickland, this is the thing that pains me as I'm a big Sean Strickland fan myself as the fighter, right? The thing that pains me the most is that we saw a little bit of success that he had with the grappling and he did it involuntarily he caught a kick cannoneer went down he started grappling started having some control time and then just completely abandoned it and it's almost like to me this is why it's not safe in my opinion to bet on sean strickland from basically this point forward not just this fight but even last fight is because we learned even if he has the tools to win, he won't always use them. He will say, I'm going to beat you at your own game. Oh, you're killer gorilla. You like to punch hard? Well, I'm going to stand in front of you and I'm going to jab you up and do all that. So realistically, this throws the middleweight division in kind of a, uh, like a little wrench in the division, right? Jared Cannonier just fought for a title, lost pretty convincingly to Israel Adesanya. And now all of a sudden they're saying, well, this win, you're back in the title picture. Do you think that's the case? I don't think so, man. And I'm glad you brought it up too, because I was thinking the entire fight card, or when they were announcing, oh, the middleweight division is uh, is up and you know it's open, it's it's completely up for grabs. How annoying! How mad would that make you as a champion to hear that? Like, I all right, dude, I beat the champ's ass that was beating everybody's ass. Y'all don't think I could beat y'all's ass? Like, what? <laughs> what do you mean it's open? Like, what yeah. do you mean it's up for grabs now? Um, unless you know, unless the champ is no longer there, then I can see where they're coming from, and I just haven't been informed about it, but. I don't know, man. I think I think Killer Gorilla, he needs a couple more instances in which we can at least see something, you know, like a little more ground game. Because I don't think the style of Jared Cannonier is going to bode well with the style of Pereira. Because Pereira, like you said, Derek, hits like a truck. So sure, he's doing better. But I don't think a win over Sean Strickland in, in the kind of fashion that he got it solidifies him for the championship title shot next. You know, give us somebody. Because if, if he would have been knocked him out like did Brunson, Mm -hmm. something like that then yeah but i think we need to see a wrestler go against Pereira or something like that to really see what this guy's made of yeah and it's tough too man because jared cannonier is rightfully so number three he just beat number six number seven sean strickland whatever you want to call it in terms of like what his current ranking is but 
where does that put you? It's kind of in the limbo, right? Like the, it's literally like, are they going to put um, Adesanya versus Pereira? Are they going to instant rematch? Who's left for Jared Cannonier? I don't know. This puts us in a very weird spot. But where do we go if we're Sean Strickland? This is the first back-to-back losses, uh, uh, back-to-back losses that he's faced in his career in quite some time, if at all. Um, I don't have it pulled up right now. But at the end of the day, I mean, Sean Strickland, you go from number seven, maybe you drop a couple of spots. But you're still one of the best in the top ten. You know what I mean? You just got to mix it up a little bit more. And this was a very close fight. At the end of the day... Yeah, this was, I mean, this was like a, 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 I'm forgetting the actual verbiage in terms of the numbers, right? But this was a one round difference in terms of the fight. I do not agree 49, 46s and stuff like that. This was a very close fight. So it's not like Sean Strickland got destroyed or anything like that. Where do we go next for Sean Strickland? Yeah, it's rough too, man. Because until Sean Strickland learns that he needs to win the fight and not beat the other guy's ego or, or, or beat his own ego or that mm-hmm. like that, He's not a safe bet, and it's it's. I, I'm saying ten top fifteen, maybe you know, mm-hmm. fight somewhere in the top fifteen because I agree with you. One of the top ten best fighters in the division, but until he starts really getting back to the you know the hands and, and mixing it up, I don't see him doing well against anybody above him. So I think he needs to fight below, fight in that fifteen range, get a little bit of confidence going back, and then come back and fight for the you know uh, upwards. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm absolutely with you. I'm looking at the rankings right now, and I'm just like, okay, the people above him, Paulo Costa, Derek Brunson, Vittori, Cannonier, Whitaker, Adesanya, Pereira. We already saw how the uh, the Whitaker fight went. We saw how the Adesanya fight went. You know what I mean? It's like, are you going to fight who? Marvin Vittori? Derek Brunson? Like, I, we already saw the Brunson fight. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a little bit of a limbo right here. But either way, interesting main event to end the year. Not the way that you want to see it ended, but, I mean, that's how it ended, folks. Now, let's talk about a bout here, AJ, that legitimately um, – this talk about th- throwing a wrench in the lightweight division right here. This put everything up back for grabs, man. Armin Sarukian just snapped Demir Ismagulov's 19 fight win streak, and he did not do it in a close fashion. He dominated Ismagulov for three rounds. And when the problem in the, or the question, I guess I should say, was can Armin Sarukian, yeah, in a three right in three round fight, yeah, he could put the pressure on, he could put the gas on, and all that good stuff, man. But like in five rounds, after round three, we start to peter out. He literally took that approach and says, "Well, this is not a five round fight. I'm going to give you everything that I got for three rounds." And he just grapple fucked Ismagulov. There was just nothing that Ismagulov really could do. And AJ, the most surprising part is that when Isma Gulov managed to uh, disrupt one of the trips, one of the throws of Sarukian, land into a full mount, Sarukian just said, oh, okay, sweep, boom, reversal, back up to the feet. Uh, Like, it was almost like, I'm just telling you right now, that is so much harder than it looks. When you have a big, strong dude who's really good at grappling in full mount on top of you, and you're just like, nah, I'm just going to stand up now. That, bro, that that blew my mind right there. So I'm going to pull up the stats right now. To, uh, Armin Sarukian, seven takedowns to zero on Demir Ismagulov, bro. I mean, come on. What are we talking about right here? How Just simply, how impressed were you for Sarukian's uh, performance? And is this really one of, like, him, Gamrot, and, I mean, I guess Volkanovsky here. Are these the only real legitimate threats to the title for Islam Makhachev right now? Hmm. Uh, one, how impressed, man, massively impressed. Talking about that sweep you're talking about when Ismagulov had him in full mount. Mm-hmm. It looks so flawless. I didn't even realize what happened. Yeah. I thought Ismagulov stood up. I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. Like, all right, this, this is wild. He literally just, whoop, no problem. Easy. Like you said, a very difficult move. Um, but is Sarukian and uh, who'd you say? Makich- or, um, Sarukian, you got like Benil Dariush, you got Matosh Gamrot, and then Gamrat you got like Volkanovsky. And Volkanovsky. Because um, that's, it's, that's what's going to have to get uh, Makachev off his throne, man, is somebody with great wrestling, great power, great uh, pressure, and also hits like a truck. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, Sarukian, and, and going back to their first fight, when Sarukian entered into the UFC, it just shows how good Makachev is. Because he's got both fighters have gotten better, but Sarukian's an absolute animal, man. So if they, this makes me even more excited for that fight going into it. And I think the Sarukian possesses the skills. Now what I'm excited to see is if we can pair him up against a boxer like a Benny Daryush, like a, somebody who's going to be able to stop that forward pressure, forward motion, and as well as hit you back harder than they're going to see. Even like a – maybe a Drakkar Close might be too – or Sarukian might be too much for a Drakkar Close, but – um. Somebody that can stop the pressure and as well as uh, hit you back hard and then we can see the hand skills, the fighting skills that Sarukin has there, then we can see what he's going to look like against Makachev because I agree he's one of the guys that's going to be going into it. Who do you think would be a good matchup, Derek? I, for Sarukin or for Makachev? Uh, Sarukin. I kind of would like to see him fight Gaethje. 
I would like to see how that plays out. Mm, I don't know if yeah. Gaethje would be able to keep him off him, but if he can, things are going to get real interesting on the feet, right? Calf kicks, big, heavy shots. I'll just say this, man. Sarukian made a fantastic point. He says, me and Isma Gulov are the two guys nobody wants to fight in this division, and you just saw what I did to Isma Gulov. Makashev is the only fight for me right now. I've already given him the toughest fight of his career. The only problem is in that assessment, AJ, you got to think about when Sarukian fought Makashev. You know what I mean? Makashev has definitely grown leaps and bounds since the first time they fought. The question is, has Sarukian? I'm not saying that he hasn't, but given that this performance against Isma Gulov is pretty fucking flawless, I do think that this is the narrative. This is the timetable. This is the fight that needs to happen. So we're going to go Makashev versus Volkanovsky. If Makashev can get past him, you got to give him Benny Dariush, right? Like, And then if he can get past Benny, then Sarukian is your time to shine. But going from number nine, you don't move much from beating a dark horse number 12 that nobody really wants to fight. So I do think, I mean, let me ask you, let me turn the table. Do you think that Sarukian needs one or two more to get a title shot? I, at least one more. Like okay. I said, one, two. I can see the UFC giving him another two because, like you said, man, Dan, mm-hmm. Benny deserves a shot as well as yeah. if he, if Makachev can get past Volkanovski, then we're talking, you know, but if Volkanovski win one, we're, we're, there's a whole mix-up. But Sarukian needs another one, another big solidified win, especially a finish. If he can get a finish on a, on a, a, a higher-ranked opponent, then I think we're talking big shots right there. If he gets another decision on another wrestler and it's it's a kind of a, another 15-minute fight, I don't know. I see him having to get another one in there. But Uncle Dane is a, a, um, a delivery, like what's the word, where you he delivers – and when you deliver, he gives you even more. Okay. So you know what I'm saying? Like that's that's Uncle Dana's mo. And if Sarukian can get a knockout on a big guy, then we see some championship material. But I think Benny's in line first. And then last question before we move past this one, man: Do you think that Sarukian has really taken to heart? My cardio needs to be ready five rounds, ready to go. You know what I'm saying? Just because. I'm not going to lie to you, but that was my big concern in this fight. Round two, I was like, dude, he might have gassed himself out. Round three, I was like, he really must have gassed himself out. But he's still just a, just, just relentless with his grappling right there. So cardio did not seem to be an issue whatsoever. Do you think he'll be ready to go for five rounds? Uh, I think he I, I think he needs to – I do. will he be ready? I don't know, man. I don't know. Because there's something weird in the body where you go for so long doing 15 minutes mm-hmm. that you go a minute past that and you die. It's like mm-hmm. the same thing in a marathon. You know, you yeah. get tired right at, mar- at mile 22 and that's where you end. Yeah. You know, you still got a couple more miles to go, but you can't. Same thing in those last couple rounds. I, I think he'll be able to, but at the moment, I don't know, man. I want to see. All right. Well, we'll find out. I will just say this, man. Demir Ismagulov still is my dark horse in the lightweight division to be able to become a champion at some point. Um, has been sidetracked a little bit, but that's okay, man. You broke your 19 fight win streak. You only got two losses on your career. You'll be all right. And you lost to one of the best in the division. Like, let's go. All right. Let's talk about this next one, man. Um, dare to be great. Alessandro Costa absolutely dared to be great in his UFC debut against Namir Albazi, who was supposed to fight the number four ranked man in the flyweight division. Um, listen, tough test, tough outing. And the dude who who has nothing but crack in his hands had to play some jujitsu in this fight but amir albazi in interesting fashion i think this is the problem when you're so good and you're so dominant and someone knows that your goal is to come out and to submit them they're going to do whatever they can to prevent that right so while yes in hindsight that minus 110 submission prop probably not the smartest the tko was probably the next best bet and we should have been looking at why is it a plus 650 uh prop you know what i mean in terms of like why why do the odds makers not think he can get it done because that's if you can't submit him you can get in the guard or you can put, put yourself in a spot where you can get that ground and pound finish and Amir Abazi absolutely did that. Now, my question to you, AJ, did you expect him to drop him in order to then finish up with a ground and pound? Or did you think you'd be able to do it simply just from guard passing and things of that nature? I thought it was going to be simply from guard passing, man. I didn't realize uh, Albazi had those kind of hands, bro. And and he was looking good. The the slower that Costa got, the better Albazi's hands were looking. And, man, that uppercut was very impressive. Um, but credit to Costa, too, man. I got to give a lot of credit to this kid because he came in. I, I forget how short of a notice, eight days, 12 days, some kind of short notice, stepped in against an absolute beast in the division, top 10 fighter in the division. And gave him a pretty damn good fight. I mean, like you said, Derek, when you go in there and, and you know the other guy is a specialist at this, you're going to be training that. So you're going to stop a lot of that. So Costa did a very good job as far as defending the ground game and all that stuff. Man, I expected it to be a lot easier. But that's what happens. You get fo- so focused on this guy's specialty that you realize that he can crack you with some hands too. And sure enough, you ate an uppercut. You go to sleep. It, it, it happens. But, man, very impressive fight for both guys. 
100%. And that's the thing, too, man. You got to think all the pressure was on Amir Albazi. You're number eight. You're fighting this random guy coming in, you know what I mean? Has <laughs> massive knockout power. So I can also see why, like, the first round was super slow. So when I was, like, first round submission, I was like, okay, well, that bet's out the window because, like, they didn't really do much at all in the first round. There was a lot of respect between the two. Um, but the question is not even, and this is, I feel bad because you don't want to disregard Costa, but you knew this was a placeholder. This was not a meaningful matchup in the division. So for Amir Albazi, it's like, who is going to be next? They're even saying, they're like, because he's saying, I'm trying to fight a ranked dude. None of these dudes want to fight me. Roy Val pulled out. Perez pulled out. Like, all these guys pulled out. So the next fight needs to be somebody ranked either higher than him or in the same level. But a lot of people are saying, well, if you don't get that ranked fight, you know who you can fight? Muhammad Makayev. And it's like, oh, that would be a good fight, bro. But also, is Makayev ready for that number eight? I know this dude is young. He's a monster and all that. He's trying to be on his Hamza. You know, I smash everybody. But do you think he's ready for Amir Obazi? Uh, I think so. I think we can give, I think you give it to him, man, because Albazi needs that kind of young fighter energy to really make a name for himself. Mohan Makayev is a, a, a problem, man, an absolute problem in division. But I feel like Albazi is just talented and, and, and experienced enough to really give uh, Mohayev a lot of problems in there. So it'd be a very, very good test. I don't like if I was the managers of both of these fighters, I wouldn't like the fight for either of the guys. But as a fan, I really like this fight going forward. Very stressful fight for both these dudes, man. Who do you think gets that one? I think um, Albazi will be able to get it done, man. I think that there might just be a little bit of a difference between the two in terms of one experience, uh, two simply mm -hmm. just strength. Makayev is a very strong dude, but I think Amir Albazi will be able to mitigate some of that relentless nonstop grappling from him, um, or at least put him in danger, right? You know, and we're going to talk about in the prelims, like a similar, right? Saeed Yoka versus uh, Nurmagomedov, right? <laughs> two powerhouse relentless dudes and then the dude who was winning who was being relentless ended up getting choked out like it is what it is but fantastic win by Miro Bazzi you got to feel for him he needs to get somebody in the top 10 preferably and probably the top five in his next fight um, but this is one here AJ man where you gotta you gotta feel good and you gotta feel bad I'm a big fan of both of these gentlemen but you have to love to see Bruce Leroy Alex Caceres land the southpaw version of Robert Whitaker's just classic, you know what I mean? Lead hand or backhand and then the kick coming over the top, man. This was poetry in motion. But Alex Caceres, he did get the TKO win over Julian Arosa, man, in a fight where I said it. I was like, the size might be a little bit too much. Arosa might be a little bit too big. But we know Arosa thrives in brawls and car crashes. Caceres, remember this is the question I asked you. I said, Caceres... Oftentimes, unless forced into that car crash, we'll pick you apart from distance and he'll do a fantastic job of it. This was literally that. He did not get lulled into the into the into the brawl, right? So at one did you did you see this coming? I'm not gonna say the knockout, but did you see this type of performance from a Caceres coming? Because I felt like the trickiness of Caceres was very quickly like it was it was a, a, such a slow start for Julian Arosa. I just felt like he wasn't able to pick up his momentum quick enough. And then by the time he got flatlined, it was just too late. What do you think? I agreed. And the problem was, is he let Caceres get into the flow. He let Caceres get that timing down and the distance down. And by the time Arosa kind of built up to that brawl level, Caceres already had his reads, bro. And as a fake southpaw myself, like I got a very strong left left leg, not a very strong left hand. But seeing somebody crack you with that left hand and then come across with that left leg, man, beautiful from Caceres. Literally, I, I tweeted it. I, jaw was on the floor, bro. This, this, And it came from when a moment you thought Arosa was really starting to build in the fight. And as an Arosa fan, you think this dude kind of starts getting into the brawl, started getting the, the commotion going, started getting the pressure going. He's really going to start building up and starting to turn this fight into his. And the next thing you know, he's on the ground. Caceres doing the little bow sits does does the yoga sit man Caceres it, it was an exciting moment I'm happy to see Caceres win I'm sad to see Arosa lose but still happy for a good fight man because uh this was this was wild bro I love seeing Bruce Leroy win I hope he gets a little bit more credit because this dude another dark horse in the division that a lot of people don't want to fight talented in every way and the UFC keeps feeding him dangerous opponents like Sting Ucho you get Julian Juicy J Arosa I'm excited to see who they're going to get match this young boy up with, with, with next to see the kind of uh, star-studded performance he puts out. 100%. And I'll just say, man, this is another example. I said it in the pre-show. Like, Alex Caceres is always overlooked, and he always overperforms. And this is like another testament of that. This is one where Arosa was the betting favorite. A lot of people didn't think uh, Caceres did have like, you know, the intangibles, the skills, the physicality to be able to keep up with him over the course of three rounds. And once again, he just goes to show, man. 
this is the dude. He's a, and it's like, come on, man. He's a perfect ambassador for the sport. You saw the post fight presser. Right? This dude is talking about we're all one. I want to feel, and this is the thing that I think is the most important. He says, I want to feel the same in victory as I do in defeat. Because at the end of the day, we're just humans. We're all one. We just come out here and we perform. And if you can keep that mentality, you can have longevity in the sport. This is a dude with double digit losses on his career. A dude who grew up in the UFC. How do you feel about that message to the world right here? Do you think that is the message, the Bushido code that we need to start passing out um, a little bit more and less drama show, less violent murderer type stuff, and then more just like humble B1 type stuff? What do you think? I, I think so, Derek. I mean, it, one, it provides you a lot of happiness, but two, a lot less stress, man. And if you can feel like uh, – I was so happy with the uh, the post-fight interview from Bruce Leroy, man. I wrote down some of those quotes. You know, mm-hmm. I had to put them on the website. I had to put them on the fucking just wherever. So you can go look at some stuff because having that kind of inner peace is nice because you're able – like like he just portrayed, man. You're able to beat some dude's ass. But also have this inner peace, inner monologue, and have this comfort of of just self worth that that is very uh, attractive and and drawing in, man. And I I love it. I think it needs to be processed a lot more because there's a lot of other things out there that are very dark and grimacing that a lot of people kind of fester on. But if you can have that kind of bushido code that Caceres has, man, have live on both sides of the coin. Um, I like it, man. I like it a lot. I don't know, Derek. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm 100%. Like I said, I think this is one of the best ambassadors for the sport right here. It's not the message that everyone's going to clamor over, right? But the real ones, they're going to say like, damn, that was some that was some real shit right there. Like when I listened to him say that, I was like, that's facts, bro. Like that is the mentality you want to keep right there. At the end of the day, um, your performance is not connected to the, your self-worth. You know what I mean? Like you should value yourself, win, winner or loser, as long as you showed up in that cage and you gave it your all. At the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, you're a winner in my book. You know what I mean? But then again, we do also understand there is a difference between winners and losers in the world so like let's let's keep that you know what i mean very transparent but big win for bruce leroy you got to feel for juicy j julian arosa but if there's one thing that we know is that he will be back and he will be back with a vengeance we know that for sure all right brother um now this is another good and a sad right here bro the drew dober of the world man came in he fought a slickster in bobby green the ambassador the the voice of the sleeper segment here on this program and he just was willing to put himself through car crash and car crash and car crash until he finally got the left hook that got the job done. Drew Dober three, threw three consecutive left hooks while getting pieced up by Bobby Green and then finally landed the, the third. And that is the whole entire point of this fight right here. From both coaches in both corners, they were more or less saying, I want you to be first and I want you to be third. And Bobby Green, while he may not have been first, he was second and third a lot, you know what I mean, until the end. What did you think about Drew Dober's performance, and how confident were you feeling about Bobby Green stealing a decision in this one after rounds one and midway through rounds two when he was just popping Dober back and forth multiple times? What did you think? A sad fight for Bobby Green when you're winning the fight, piecing this dude up, bloodying him up. And this guy is just relentless and has a lot of power and can eat punches left and right. I mean, Drew Dober, we were talking about it before. This dude is a a specimen of a human being, man. Muscular, looks good, classic, you know, Ken Barbie doll. But homeboy's got a brick for a head. And you can tell he was just eating shots left and right, man. And and, uh, it was a a great fight for both guys, man. I thought Bobby Green was looking good, man. Like you said, round and a half, popping these shots, had all the movement going, frustrating Dober. But you can only be so frustrated when you're just throwing big shots and then land a big one and, and put your boy to sleep. Um, man, this was a, a rough fight. But I, what's nice is I don't think Bobby Green loses any stock here. I think both fighters elevate. Both fighters elevate in this fight, man. And it makes me more excited to see Dober against another brawler, man. Because you can tell both guys are in there. They had the same kind of code. We're like, oh, yeah, we're going to make this a fun fight. One, somebody here is going to sleep. Somebody here is going to have you know a six-month uh, medical suspension. We're going to have both get paid a hell of a lot of money, brother. Let's have some fun. And it was a very fun fight. I think this was the people's main event, man. A lot of good. And and another, like you said, Derek, happy to see Dober win. Ha- mm-hmm. Sad to see Green lose. But either way, even more excited to see a, a good fight right here. So what does it mean to you that Bobby Green has been finished by three men in the UFC, right? I'm going to tell you the first two because you should know that these are the last two fights, right? It's Drew Dober and it's Islam Makashev. If you had to just throw a random guess out there without looking anything up, like who do you think would be the only other person in the, and I'll just give you the hint, right? Lightweight division. um, Who's the only other person who has finished Bobby Green in his UFC tenure? If I had to guess, I'm going to say it's somebody early, like a Michael Johnson. 
you're in the in a close vicinity it's actually dustin poirier right okay, so those are the yeah. only three guys to finish you right now what does it mean to you that drew dober not only tied dustin poirier for most knockouts in the lightweight division but he did it on a dude who's notoriously very difficult to put away in a in a bobby green excuse me man like you got to think drew dober's stock is raising higher than ever until hit the brakes you call out Jalen Turner, the tarantula, the six <laughs> three monster, and he says, "I want all of those problems. I want all of that smoke." When I saw the call out, I was like, "Drew Dober, you're calling your shot. You're daring to be great." But Jalen Turner is that really the guy that you want? I mean, <laughs> see, even that it, it hits you in the chest. You're like, "Oh my lord!" Like, come on, bro. So, do you need a second, brother, to digest this information? Nah, man. No, okay. I mean, <laughs> Drew Dober wants all the smoke, bro. Cause when I I forgot it was such a ballsy call out. Yeah, I forgot he called up the tarantula, bro. <laughs> Jalen Turner's a problem. Yeah. Oh my god. And and makes it even more credit to Drew Dober, cause that's a hell of a fight that a lot of people are turning down. Man, yeah, I think uh, stock is rising and rising very, very yeah. fast for Drew Dober. If we can see that fight come together, man, I'm, that, that would be a uh, uh, one you pay for. Put that one on the UFC on pay-per-view. That's right. That's right. And I will say Drew Dober, man, I mean, he did another great call out. He says, listen, Bobby Green's the only dude to accept a fight with me. Nobody else wants to fight me. Mm-hmm. That goes to show something right there, man. All right, brother. So big win by Drew Dober. He got a feel for Bobby Green. But once again, in classic fashion, Bobby the King Green, he will be back. Now, in just a one-sided railroad demolition of a campaign right here, Mikhail Oleksicek, or maybe Mihel, you know, they say it a bunch of different ways a bunch of different times. He got taken down by Cody Brundage, which was Cody Brundage's pretty much only chance of victory in our eyes going into this bout. And Oleksicek reversed him and smashed his face in for the TKO victory. It was very one-sided. I know you messaged me on, on real quick being like, yo, for 45 seconds, how worried were you? And I told you, not worried at all because you got to keep this up for 15 minutes if you want to win. Alexa Chuck, man, he's too big, too strong. You know what I mean? Too powerful. What would you think? I was then for about 45 seconds, Derek, I was on the edge of my seat so excited because I thought the same thing. I thought I thought Alexi Chuck was too strong, too big, too talented to uh, be controlled by Brundage. Brunish had a smile on his face. He was looking good. He was controlling him. He had the backpack on him. And then we saw Alexi Chuck literally turn him around and, and use his man strength and just flip him around and beat him up. And uh, it, was a, it was a sad one, man. I was very excited because this, this was the start of my Hail Mary. If this, if this fight could have went Brundage, Brundage's way, I thought the tables were going to be turning, Derek. We're going to be making some moves. The storyline was going to be lining up. Turns out the planets don't align sometimes when you got a, uh, a Polish, you know, the Polish power. I'm pretty sure Alexi Chuck is Polish. Um, but you got a, a hammer like my, my call Alexi Chuck coming at you, man. The planets don't align up as always. And Brundage got the worst of it. He was smiling until he went to sleep from, from some hammer fists. Big, big, big fight for Alexi Chuck, man. Uh, yeah, not much you can say, bro. He looked good. Yeah, man. And Cody Brundage is coming off of like two knockout wins, man. Like, so this is like... It's tough, but Alexi Chuck, he did what the odds makers, everybody else pretty much expected him to do. So this was one way demolition traffic. I want to see who they give to Alexi Chuck next um, because this dude is very talented, man. But for now, he ends 2022 with a bang, with a legitimate bang, with a knockout win. And you got to love to see that one, man. All right, brother. Folks, that was your final main card recap of 2022. You got to love it. It's been a very eventful year. And if you if you have not subscribed yet, you should absolutely subscribe right now. Smash that subscribe button. Share the show with your friends. Tell them to subscribe and just let everybody know. We already gave you the numbers. If you want stats, we're both of us 60, above 60% on 230 picks this year. Literally, go check your ESPNs, your MMA junkies, your other media outlets for MMA Go pull how they're doing, compare it to ours, and we'll leave it at that. Now, let's go over a couple of fun prelims, man. We have a little bit of time here. Um, and the first one that I want to talk about one is one that we had a little contested, but I both think that we came up on the right side of things when we said Cheyenne Vlismas versus Corey McKenna. She needs to watch out for Corey McKenna because while it might not be flashy, McKenna knows how to grind out a victory, and that's exactly what she did on our featured prelim. Now, you have some that are um, feeling a little salty towards Cheyenne Vlismas, who did ultimately say, listen, I dropped the ball, a win is a win is a win, and she got the dub. But there was a note that she had said, starting up the third round, yelling across the cage, hey, you want to try striking now? <laughs>